then there's me. <laughs> so, Artemis Joukowsky III is from Sherbourne, Massachusetts, and has acted as environmental venture capitalist, entrepreneur, nonprofit activist, and film producer for the past 20 years of his life. More recently, served as executive producer of the HBO Cries for Syria, which is a documentary and exploration of the humanitarian crisis in Syria and of the devastating civil war that has <coughs> defined the country the past five years that premiered recently in March of 2017 on HBO. He has also worked as PBS director and co-producer with Ken Burns for Defying the Nazis, The Sharps War, a 90-minute documentary about Waitstill and Martha Sharp, who played a role in relief and rescue of World War II refugees, including many Jews in 1939 in Prague and 1940 in southern France. There have been over 3.5 million viewers. And that is also a story I will let Artemis tell more about that he is closely connected to. He is also a co-developer of education curriculum facing with history and ourselves, which reaches over 2 million students in 50,000 schools worldwide. And Artemis is also a producer of Carbon Nation, a film about solutions to the global warming crisis. He has devoted much of life to improving experience of living with multiple disabilities and promoting community services and has been involved in additional film projects, including a documentary about 2014 Paralympic ice hockey team, a documentary about the high levels of violence against people with disabilities, and a film about Boston Ballet's adaptive dance program for children with autism and Down syndrome. And he is here to talk about some of his film project with you today. Um, so please give a warm welcome to Artemis Zukowski III. Yes. Well, it's an honor and pleasure to be here, Cheryl. Thank you for waiting as long as you did for having me come to the show. It's an honor because I um, feel very much like uh, an emerging filmmaker and, a, and an opportunity to share my story with you is, um, is really not just revival for me, but also inspiring for what I want to share with you in terms of my next work. But what we're going to do today is I'm going to tell you a little bit about three films that I've just finished all have been broadcast in the last six months. And really the most exciting part for me is to share my own process as a filmmaker and how I've learned from Ken Burns and how I've learned from my colleagues at No Limits Media, but also how I learned from the subject matter, how I learned from the intimacy I feel with my subject matter. And um, you'll know a little bit more why I feel so passionately about that. But what I want to do is show you a very short opening of my first film called Defying the Nazis. And we'll show that and then I'll give a little background to how this story came to evolve. And you'll notice a kind of a, let's say a, an emerging actor, kind of the voice of my grandfather. So let's just play that first cut and then we'll come back. What is it in a human being that gives up what is comfortable and safe and familiar for something that is not only uncomfortable, but dangerous and life-threatening? Who are we is the animating question in the work that I try to do. And this is a story that woke me up. I think what's so wonderful is that it touches on religious faith in the United States on the evil of the Holocaust and the, the monstrous Nazi regime. This intersects with that, with the role of government and what's the responsibility of individual citizens. How individuals can stand up against regimes as brutal as the Nazis. Minister and his wife, they figured out how to write in code. They figured out smuggling of human lives. They figured out how to get past Nazi guards. I mean, this is not stuff they teach you in divinity school. So I had the fun of, um, for the last three years, working with Ken Burns to finish this film. Mm -hmm. And what's beautiful is this, this is a story of my grandparents. Mm -hmm. These two people had the courage to leave their family, my mom and my uncle, and go in 1939 to help their sister church in Prague. Mm -hmm. 
and do whatever they could to help refugees, to help uh, women and children, but mostly people who would be endangered by the Nazis, Jews, liberals, uh, religious uh, 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 liberals um, and, and also social democrats. And this story happened to, to me by accident. I didn't know anything about my grandparents. I lived in a different country when I was young and I was 14 years old and I was given an assignment to interview someone of moral courage from my teacher and I went home and I said, Mom, who should I interview? And she said, well go interview your grandparents. They did some cool things during World War II. And this interview changed my life because for the first time I saw that my own path, my own story as a young man was not to focus on what I could do for myself, but what I could do for others. And at that same time, I was diagnosed with a neuromuscular disease called muscular dystrophy. And I didn't think I was gonna live long and I was feeling a little bit sorry for myself. And my grandmother, this remarkable woman, came into my hospital room and said, you're not going to feel sorry for yourself anymore. Let's go help other people. Mm -hmm. And really that began, in my own way, a journey of not focusing my pain or my suffering or my challenges as a man with a disease internally, but to take it outside and focus on others. And it began a journey of learning what the power of service is. and really the karmic wheel of love, that the more you, you love others, the more love you get back in return. And it really just multiplies and multiplies. And so my next film that I want to share something about is about a horrible situation going on. And I felt a, a, a burning sense that I had to tell this story, that as much as I was um, excited about my grandparents' story of moral courage and what we could each learn, we also need to celebrate people today. And we're gonna show you a, a quick segment of a film that just premiered on, PB, on HBO called Cries from Syria. Syria, Syria is a very, very ancient, ancient and beautiful, and beautiful country. country. It's, called it's called the cradle, the cradle of civilization. civilization. But, but we have been living under dictatorship for 40 years. But we were, but we were so optimistic that the revolution will sooner or later start in Syria. They wrote, it's your, it's your turn, turn, doctor, because Bashar al-Assad was trained as a doctor. But anyone who talk about him, he will just disappear or he will die. It was horrible. It started the revolution all over Syria. More than half a million people joined the demonstrations. Our job is to save their life through destroying the terrorists. We demonstrated holding roses, and he called us terrorists. This regime, they are supposed to protect us, but they are not protecting us. They are shooting us. when the Russians got involved, things are getting worse every day. We Syrians are the people who are suffering the most from ISIS. There is a group of people who give us hope, a group who are trying to save lives. We are not terrorists. We are people like everyone in this world. And we still have dreams. So what deeply inspired me about this filmmaker and, and the work that he had done was to really work with local activists to collect their data on their phones and send it in to a central repository of editors who would then 
work with the material on a regular basis until we were finished. And so all the cinematography of this film was largely done by people in the streets themselves, people capturing these moments on their iPhones and then sending them in. And then the empowerment of them knowing that their footage mattered, that they were not just in an isolated moment of sharing their story, that their footage actually might have an impact in shaping the conversation about what to do about Syria. And, and for me, this was um, the natural extension of my first film where I really felt like I wanted to tell a personal family story about courage and about rescue. But this was happening right in front of us and I couldn't ignore the power of this story. So I joined this team and really helped to curate these beautiful images, uh, powerful and very painful images of people literally being destroyed in front of your eyes, children being killed, and really waking people up with the horrors of war. Um, and, and this team um, you know, is gonna keep doing this work in Syria. We're still getting footage on a regular basis because we feel that the, the call for this kind of information is one of the only things that can stop you know, the brutality of the situation. And so for me, the, the last piece I wanted to share with you is a film that happened in the, in, the, in the process of making these other two films where I had the chance of meeting a man who had changed my life. And uh, he was a next door neighbor to a family that we knew in, 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 in Arizona. And in the process of going to Arizona to show our first film, we met this man and we just finished this film. And this, this is really my prayer for humanity, is this last piece. So it's called Portrait of Harry. There are some things that stay with you for a long, long time. I am one of the last survivors. The Nazis came, they dragged some Jewish men out of streetcars. It was the first time in my life that I saw someone killed. And all the synagogues were burned, all the Jewish shops were destroyed, passports were not available anymore. I had to leave my family, and needless to say, all the people are left. Tighted in camps. Everything was taken from him, and still, he survived. I learned how to forgive. The more you hate, the more you die. Harry's life and its meaning has been to bring beauty to people. I wanted to show a world that I experienced when I was young a brighter world. Here is a man who is facing death. I mean, I don't know how many days he has. I don't know how many months or years. I'm at peace with what is happening. I think Harry can teach the next generation, no matter what somebody goes through, that you can always find the, the joy and the happiness and the beauty of life. I was influenced by Harry by his positivity, by his lack of fear, by his courage, by his love. I realize that my weeks are numbered and I try to live them as best as I can. You have to look at what you have given the world and he can look forward and say, I have given them beauty. I am blessed that I am here at a time in his life when he does not have to face this journey alone. What happens when you leave this world? I don't know. One way or another, I'm going to find out. And one of the most beautiful parts of that story is um, meeting through that story the love of, of my life who's sitting right here. And, you know, that's part of the beauty of, of, of having a chance to tell 
such personal stories is that you start to fall in love with really everyone. You, you start to, to, to understand even, even the challenging figures who uh, provoke you and teach you um, become part of your spiritual family. And as you try to show images that change people's perceptions of reality, you also learn yourself about those images. You emerge. And each time I watch my films, or each time I watch other people's films now, I'm, I'm a student of that process of intimacy, where the director or the editor, where all the storytellers are engaged in trying to give you something that is the best of their story. Um, and sometimes that can be very difficult to communicate. But once, once you let your, 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 your hair down, once you are vulnerable with the material, the story tells itself. And uh, that's what I loved about what you shared about your own story, is that you engaged in it. It's your experience, and uh, that's the fun I've had. The next big project I'm doing is I have a, uh, an amazing piece of news. There is a cure to my disease, wow. and I will be among the first adults ever to receive this cure. Mm -hmm. And I will be making a film not just for film, but for NIH and for research about, by taking this cure, what will happen to me as a guinea pig, as, a, as an adult who is trying to find a cure to this disease. Um, so look for that very soon. We'll be, we'll be filming that um, in the next couple years. So thank you so much, and uh, an honor to be with you. Thank you. Calling for our people to be.
be free. Longing for those days of freedom and glory, calling for our people to be free. So we're calling all the children to the land of Zion, calling for our people to be free. No man will hurt us in the land of glory, calling for our people to be free. As we rise. with a remote camera leaves planet Earth and takes off into space taking pictures along the way, click. It comes across a planet, click, or a moon, click, click. Then come the rings of Saturn, click, click, click. The camera glances back and captures a picture of planet Earth between the mighty rings, click. The picture comes out as just one tiny pixel in the vastness of space, click. One small pixel, a tiny dot, a speck of a place, and in this speck is a mass of humanity, the wide branches of the plant and animal kingdoms and all three kinds of rocks, and the great depths of the great seas and oceans, volcanoes and lightning storms and ice caps, wars and babies born and old people dying every second. Remote viewing brings our total remoteness forward. Earth is so tiny. It looks like it could be swept away like a table crumb or blown away like a speck of dust. This coordinate of space, this location, marks a spot, click. And we need to zoom in very carefully to find our way back home. This is a history lesson, but it doesn't tell the whole story. A history lesson can never tell the whole story because no one knows the story of everyone who lived and loved and laughed and cried, how they lived and why they died. History books leave out most of the story. Some of us tell our own stories, and I am going to tell you part of mine. You won't be mentioned in this story, just like you are not mentioned in the history books, and yet, you are part of this story, just as you are part of every history lesson. Because we are all connected from the past and into the future, connected in ways we will never, ever know by a thread that we cannot see. We are shaped by the past, and we shape those who come after us in the future. So at the end of every story, is the unspoken truth that what happens next is up to all of us. You could say that my story begins in 1948 when I was born, or you could say it begins in 1938 when my parents got married, or you can go back to the 1800s when my mother's family came from France to Canada, or to the 1700s when my father's family came from Germany to Maryland. You could go back even further, and you could ask, why did they come, and why were they allowed to stay? Or you could say that that story began back before the 1600s, when Africans were forced to come to this country in slavery. But this part of my story begins in 1970, when I fell in love with and married a black man. Terrible to have to turn pages. I married this man when people still called interracial marriage miscegenation, which rhymes with aberration. Miscegenation defined as the interbreeding of different races, 
a definition that dehumanizes the lovers, relegating them to the status of breeding farm animals. A word used to write laws about love, laws that regulated, defined, sliced and diced love into codes of who to love, as if love resides in the color of one's skin, as if love is something to be feared, as if love can be contained in a book of regulations, as if, as if love is not the most powerful force on earth. Miscegenation, which rhymes with aberration. Aberration, defined as deviating from the norm, the rules, the moral path. In 1967, anti-miscegenation laws were deemed unconstitutional. So our love was legal in every state. But to many, it was still an aberration. This is just part of my story. We had five sons, and each one of them is living their own story, their own separate version of lives in black and white. But what happens in those stories is partially up to you, because what happens next is up to all of us. Thank you. Peach and pear, apricot, then